Hi everyone, welcome to the Kim Help ASAP Wednesday live stream. I hope that you are doing well. I do want to check with my moderator that my microphone is working okay. It seemed to have a little bit of trouble beforehand. Um, so uh, today we are going to be doing reactions of acids and bases. So last uh, last time, that was two weeks ago, we talked about just acids and bases alone, but now we're going to put them together and we're going to do reactions. So we're going to talk about equivalence points and we're going to be calculating pHs not only at equivalence points, but right before and right after equivalence points as well, so you can see how the pH changes there. Um, as always, we want to know what you think, what, what you need help with. So uh, if you have a request for a future live stream, if there's a topic you would like me to cover, please just uh, contact me. You can contact me through YouTube. You can contact me through Facebook. You can email me. Any of those works just fine. And let me know how we can best help you. Okay, with that being said, we are going to jump into our acid base problems. Okay, so here is our first problem. It is a multi-part problem. So even though it's only going to look like we're doing two problems, we're actually going to be doing quite a few different calculations with it. So let's just read through this one first and, and then we'll jump on in. A 20 milliliter sample of 0.95 molar barium hydroxide is titrated with a 0.75 molar solution of nitric acid. How many milliliters of nitric acid are needed to be or need to be added to reach the last equivalence point? What is the pH at the equivalence point? And then here's kind of where the multi-part comes in. What is the pH of the reaction 15 milliliters before the equivalence point? And what is the pH of the reaction 15 milliliters after the equivalence point? So you have to kind of imagine you're doing this in a lab and you're kind of monitoring the pH as you go. But for us with this kind of problem where we're just working on the math, it's easier to start with the equivalence point and then work a little bit backwards and work a little bit forwards. Okay, the one thing before I start I want to point out is in these mathematical calculations, we talk about equivalence points and not endpoints. So when you're actually doing a titration, you might talk about the end point. So I do want to mention the difference between an equivalence point and an end point. So an equivalence point is um, in a titration where you have stoichiometric equivalent amount of acid and base. Um, and in a one-to-one -one ratio, this would be where they are equal. Now, if you have like a diprotic or triprotic acid, you will have two or three equivalent points. But equivalence points are based on the stoichiometry. They're based in the math. Now, when you're actually doing a titration in lab, you are most likely going to be using an indicator, an acid base indicator. And this is something that is going to change color very close to to the pH of the equivalence point. However, you never can get an acid base indicator that's gonna change exactly at the equivalence point. So that's when we call it an end point. So it should be close enough for the calculations to work out just fine, but it's not gonna be the exact same thing as an equivalence point. So an end point is used when you're using, when you're looking for a color change from an indicator, but an equivalence point is what we talk about when we are actually doing the stoichiometry of an acid-base reaction. So for our problems here, we are specifically doing calculations and we are working with equivalence points, not endpoints. Okay, with that clarification being said, let's actually talk about the math of this problem. So what we've got is we have a base, we have barium hydroxide, this is a strong base, and we have an acid, we have nitric acid, this is a strong acid. So this is a strong acid, or sorry, a strong base reacting with a strong acid. So the first thing we need to write down is we need to write down our chemical equation and we need to balance it. So let's start with that. Um, if you're ever unsure where to go in a chemistry problem, honestly, starting with a balanced chemical equation is a great place to start. And at least kind of gets the brain working. Okay, so we have nitric acid 
plus barium hydroxide. All right, so when you have an acid reacting with a base, what are our products? Well, uh, these are, again, assuming we're looking working with either Arrhenius acids and bases or Lewis acids and bases, an acid reacting with a base will give you salt and water. So I, I usually write the salt first, but it really doesn't make a difference. You can also think of these as a double replacement reaction. So you're flip-flopping cations, um, or you can think about flip-flopping anions. So the salt in this case is going to take the, the cation from barium, and it, I'm going to take the anion from nitric acid. Of course, make sure you're making a neutral compound. Remember, barium has a plus two charge. Nitrate has a negative one charge. And it's going to make water as well. And again, water you can think of um, not only as H2O, but if you're thinking about switching like um, cations and anions, you can think of it as HOH. All right, so... Looking at this reaction, this is great. We've predicted products, but we have not balanced it. This is not a balanced chemical equation yet, so let's balance it. So what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to put a 2 in front of our nitric acid and a 2 in front of our water. So this is an acid-base reaction that is not a 1 to 1, but a 2 to 1, or you can think of it as a, a 1 to 2 reaction. So it, it adds a little bit of twist to the standard acid-base reaction. Okay, so now we need to figure out how many milliliters of our nitric acid need to be added to reach, again, the last equivalence point. And you might be saying, well, wait, why are they saying the last equivalence point? What does that mean? Well, barium hydroxide, because it has um, two hydroxide anions, it will actually have two equivalence points. So this is analogous to having a diprotic acid. And of course, if you have a diprotic acid, you're going to have two equivalence points. So um, this base will actually have two equivalence points. We are going to the second or the last equivalence point here. So what we want is we want stoichiometric equivalent amounts of acid and base. So the first thing that we have to know is how many moles of one or the other we have. So if I go back to my problem, I see that I have volume and concentration for barium hydroxide and I only have concentration of nitric acid. So I, I can't calculate my moles of nitric acid. I can calculate my moles of barium hydroxide. Another way to think about this is if you look at the question itself, it says how many milliliters of nitric acid are needed to reach this equivalence point. So you can think of this as you have your barium hydroxide solution in a flask and you are slowly adding nitric acid. So whichever way makes the most sense to you, that is the way I want you to think about this. But I'm gonna go ahead and calculate my moles of barium hydroxide because I have the information to do so. So remembering that molarity equals moles of solute over liters of solution. This is an, is an equation that we are going to be using over and over and over again in this live stream. So I won't, I'll put the equation up here, but later on I'll just start plugging numbers in. Okay, so for barium hydroxide, we know our concentration and we know our volume so we can calculate our moles. So our concentration here is 0 0.950 molar. And I don't know my moles of barium hydroxide yet. And I do know my liters of solution. So again, this is 20 milliliters. I'm just gonna do a quick conversion here to liters of solution. So my X is going to be 0 0.0190. And again, this is moles of barium hydroxide. Just like when you're doing any kind of stoichiometry problem, whether it's acids and bases or anything else, make sure you put all of your units down. So the temptation here is to just put 0 0.019 moles, but you really want to be careful and you want to make sure that you label that as moles of barium hydroxide, because as you're going to see as we work through this problem, we're going to have 
moles everywhere, and you're going to want to know what compound you're talking about. Okay, so now that we know how many moles of barium hydroxide we have, what I want to do with that is I want to use that moles and do stoichiometry with it. So I'm going to take this moles of barium hydroxide and I'm going to figure out how many moles of nitric acid I need to react all of that moles of barium hydroxide. So basically what I want to do is a, a limiting reactant problem where I'm left with zero of my barium hydroxide. So this is really, it sounds more complex than it is. So I'm going to take my moles of barium hydroxide. Uh, this is barium hydroxide. And I'm going to use my balanced chemical equation up here to calculate my moles of nitric acid that I need to use up all of these moles of barium hydroxide. And this is very simple. So I have a one in front of my moles of barium hydroxide. Again, I'm just getting this from our balanced chemical equation. This is why it's so important to make sure not only that you write down your chemical equation, but that you make sure it's balanced as well. And again, this two comes from this two up here. Um, sorry, moles of nitric acid. Now, a lot of times in just stoichiometry problems, you might be tempted to go to grams. And, and you can, that's okay, but you're going to find that you're going to convert back out to moles. So I'm just going to stay with moles. So this calculation is actually really easy. You're just going to multiply by two. And that gives me 0 0.0380 moles of nitric acid. Again, you can see why not just putting moles is helpful because I have two different moles, so I wanna make sure that I label which compound it goes with so you don't use the wrong thing. Okay, so if I'm gonna titrate or use up all of my moles of barium hydroxide, I need to add this many moles of nitric acid. Well, the problem didn't ask me how many moles of nitric acid I needed. It asked me how many milliliters of nitric acid that I needed. Um, so I need to take my moles of nitric acid and figure out how many milliliters that is. Well, in this case, I'm going to go back to my concentration um, equation, plug in moles. And again, I know the actual concentration so I can figure out the volume. So in this case my concentration of nitric acid. Again, make sure you're pairing up the right concentration with the right compound because it's very easy to pull that concentration out. So my concentration of nitric acid is 0.75. I know my moles, 0 0.0380. And again, this is moles of nitric acid. And I'm going to calculate my liters of solution. Actually, I'll call this X liters of solution. So this is what is going to give me my volume. Now, when I calculate X, of course, it's going to give it to me in liters, which I will then convert into milliliters. Okay, so X is 0 0.0507, and that is liters. So to convert that to milliliters, again, it's just, you're just moving the decimal three spaces, and that's milliliters of nitric acid. Okay, so this is the first part of this question. How many milliliters of nitric acid need to be added to reach, again, the second or the last equivalence point? You are going to need 50.7 milliliters of nitric acid. All right, that is our first question done, but we need to keep going because there are multiple questions here. So the next question is, what is the pH at the equivalence point? All right, so this is where we need to do a little conceptual thinking. So at the equivalence point, of course, we have no nitric acid and we have no barium hydroxide because we've reacted them in just the right ratio that um, our amounts of our reactants go to zero. So then what is left? Well, what is left is our barium nitrate and our water, like that's it. So which one of these compounds is going to dominate our pH in this case? Well, this is where it's helpful to understand acid and base properties of salt. So barium nitrate is a salt. 
Um, does it have any acid-base properties? Well, to figure that out, you have to think about, all right, where is the cation coming from? What base is coming from barium hydroxide? That is a strong base. So that means barium on its own as a cation really does not have any acid-base properties. Well, what about the nitrate? What acid is that coming from? Well, that's coming from nitric acid, which again is a strong acid. So nitrate in and of itself does not have any acid-base properties. So the salt barium nitrate is not a salt that is going to change the pH. So then what dominates the pH if not barium nitrate? Well, the water dominates the pH. So when water dominates your pH, let's go to our next slide here. You're really talking about the auto ionization of water. And all that means is a molecule of water reacting with another molecule of water. And this is an equilibrium. And you're going to get a little bit of hydronium ion and a little bit of hydroxide. Now, obviously, this equilibrium favors the reactants very heavily, but we know these concentrations um, because, you know, this is part of how we calculate pH. So we have our concentration of hydronium for the auto ionization of water is equal to 1 times 10 to the negative 7th molar. You might remember this from a different equation. So this equation might be more familiar in terms of jogging your memory. So you probably learned all the different ways to calculate pH and pOH and concentration of hydronium and concentration hydroxide. This equation right here comes from the auto ionization of water, which is right here. So that both of these, the hydronium concentration and the hydroxide concentration multiplied together gives you 10 to the negative 14th. But of course, in the auto ionization of water, they are equal, which means each is 10 to the negative 7th. All this to say, <laughs> Our pH is simply the negative log of our hydronium concentration times 10 to the negative 7th, which means our pH is 7. So uh, usually with these kind of problems with a strong acid and a strong base, you're going to create a or you're going to form a salt that doesn't have any acid base properties and your pH is going to be seven at the equivalence point, which is maybe what you thought of at the beginning, but you might not have known why. But the reason why is because at the equivalence point, it's just water that is creating the pH. And of course, pure water has a pH of seven, but mathematically, th this is why this happens. Okay, so it looks like there, oh, was maybe a question, but it didn't quite come through. Well, I'll, I'll wait and, and see if another question comes through. Okay, so let me just swipe back here and let's go back to our problem. Okay, so we have the pH at the equivalence point. We've calculated the volume. So now what we want to know is what is the pH of the reaction 15 milliliters before the equivalence point? So we know at the equivalence point the pH is 7. So what was our pH when we are 15 milliliters before the equivalence point? Okay. I'm coming back here to do some calculations. So I'm going to change the color here. We'll put, talk about this. This is going to be 15 milliliters before equivalence point, just so we keep track of what all of our calculations are. All right, so. Uh, first, I want to know what, what is my volume, 15 millers before the equivalence point. Um, so I know that, again, I calculated this. My volume at the equivalence point is 50.7. So I'm going to take 50.7 milliliters, and I'm going to subtract 15 milliliters. So this tells me that... 15 milliliters before the equivalence point, I have only added 35.7 milliliters of nitric acid. Again, I am I took my sample of barium hydroxide and I am slowly adding nitric acid to it. All right, so 
this is my volume of nitric acid that I have added when I'm 15 milliliters before my equivalence point. Now, ultimately, I'm trying to get to my pH here. But what I've got to do first is I've got to do some more, really, I've got to do some more stoichiometry. All right, so to do stoichiometry, of course, I've got to convert this milliliters into how many moles I have added. So using... Let me just pop back here. Again, I'm going back to my concentration um, equation there. I have a concentration. Again, make sure you're using the concentration for nitric acid. This is going to give me X moles of nitric acid. And I know that I have added 35.7 milliliters, but again, I just converted this into little, uh, to liters, sorry. So my X is 0 0.0268 moles of nitric acid. Okay, so that means 15 milliliters before my equivalence point, I have only added 0 0.02 moles of nitric acid. Now this makes sense with our previous calculation. Again, I'm just going to swipe back to the previous screen here. So I'm going to need to add at least 0 0.038 moles to reach the equivalence point. So it makes sense that my moles of nitric acid should be a little bit less because I haven't quite reached my equivalence point. Whenever you're working through these calculations, just always do that kind of logic check. Does this make sense? Yes, we're before the equivalence point. So our moles of nitric acid that we have added at this point should be less. Okay, so we have only added this many moles of nitric acid. What we're doing now is really a limiting reagent problem because we have moles of barium hydroxide and we have moles of nitric acid. But the nice thing about this situation is we don't have to figure out what the limiting reagent is. We already know what the limiting reagent is, right? So we already know that we haven't added quite enough nitric acid and we're going to have excess barium hydroxide. So nitric acid is going to be our limiting reagent. So I'll just put a little note here. This is our limiting reagent. Now, of course, you can go through the calculations and figure out what the limiting reagent is mathematically, and, and you will come to the same answer. But this is where, again, a little bit of logic will help save you um, maybe a few calculations down the road. So we know that nitric acid is our limiting reagent. Well, knowing that nitric acid is our limiting reagent, we can figure out the excess of barium hydroxide that we have left over. Now to figure out our excess of barium hydroxide, we already know how many moles we started with. We need to know how many moles of barium hydroxide have reacted. And then we can subtract that and figure out how many moles of barium hydroxide are left remaining so that we can then calculate pH. Okay, so taking my moles of my limiting reactant, uh, 268, moles of nitric acid. And again, I'm going to be using the mole ratio for my balanced chemical equation. So this is two moles of nitric acid to one mole of barium hydroxide. So I have used 0 0.0134 moles of barium hydroxide or you could think of that as that's how many moles of barium hydroxide have reacted i'm just going to put used right here so again remember just kind of what's happening in your flask we are continuously reacting the nitric acid with the barium hydroxide we haven't quite gotten to the equivalence point so we should have some leftover barium hydroxide so this calculation tells us how many moles of barium hydroxide have already been reacted so that we can figure out how many are still remaining and i'm going to need to add an extra page here okay that's much better all right, so that is how many moles we have used. So what we wanna do is we wanna take our moles of barium hydroxide that we started with, 
how many moles we have used. We are going to subtract those two amounts and that will tell us how many moles of barium hydroxide remain. Now we've already done some of these calculations. So I'm gonna pop back here. So how many moles of barium hydroxide we started with? We calculated this at the very beginning. We started with this 0 0.019 moles. That's how many moles we started with. All right, so I'm just gonna plug that in here. 0 0.0190, and again, this is moles of barium hydroxide. How many moles of barium hydroxide have we used so far? We just did that calculation. Here it is right here. This is how many moles of barium hydroxide we have used at this point. And again, it makes sense that we have not used all of it. This is another logic check. If you find that you have used more moles than you started with, something has gone off somewhere. Now, when you are subtracting moles, you need to make sure that you have moles of the same compound. So I can't subtract moles of barium hydroxide from moles of nitric acid and get um, an answer that makes sense. So you notice I'm subtracting moles of barium hydroxide at the start, moles of barium hydroxide that I have used, and this will give me moles of barium hydroxide that remain. Okay, so if you do this calculation, you get 0 0.0056 moles of barium hydroxide that remain. Okay, so we still haven't answered our question. We're getting there though, we're, we're getting there, we're getting close because now we're just that much closer to calculating pH. So, oh, let's make sure that there's not a, a question. Okay, nope, nope, we're good. At least so far, we're good. All right, so now we've got to get to pH, and this is going to be a multi-step problem. This is why, honestly, this is a, a good question, because um, we're dealing with bases here, which tend to give problems, and we're also dealing with a 1 to 2, or again, 2 to 1 ratio of um, acids and bases, which always makes things a little more interesting. Okay. I'm going back to a chemical equation. So what we need to keep in mind is what happens with barium hydroxide in aqueous solutions. Okay, so barium hydroxide, once you put it in an aqueous solution, of course, you get the barium cation and you get two hydroxide anions. All right, again, this is another one to two ratio that we need to keep in mind. So if we have 0 0.0056 moles of barium hydroxide, what we really need to do is we need to calculate how many moles of hydroxide we need. Because remember, to get to pH, ultimately, we're going to get to the hydronium ion. But if we can get to the hydroxide ion, get into hydronium is a piece of cake. So I really want to know how many moles of hydroxide I have. So I'm, I'm going to do stoichiometry again. So I'm starting with my 0 0.0056 moles of barium hydroxide and using my balanced equation, I'm going to calculate moles of hydroxide. Now, the one nice thing about doing all of this stoichiometry is we are just staying in moles the whole time. So it makes it just a one-step stoichiometry problem, um, which makes things a little bit easier. Okay, so if I multiply that by two, I'm going to get one, one, two moles of hydroxide. All right. I'm getting closer. Now at least I'm talking about hydroxide. I have got moles of hydroxide. But remember when we're calculating pH or pOH, we need concentration. So again, remembering concentration is moles over liters of solution. Well, I, I have my moles, that's great, but I don't yet have my liters of solution. Okay, so total liters of solution again, at this point. So I need to remember how many milliliters of barium hydroxide I started with. And if I flip back to my problem, I started with a 20 milliliter sample of barium hydroxide. Okay, so I started with 20 milliliters and now I have added some milliliters, right? So how many milliliters have I added? That is back on the previous page. 0.0056. 
I have added 35.7 milliliters of nitric acid, so my volume has increased. So I've taken my 20 milliliters, I'm going to add my 35.7 milliliters, and this is going to give me 55.7 milliliters, which of course is 0 0.0557 liters of solution. So now I can calculate my concentration. So my concentration is simply going to be my moles of hydroxide. One, one, two moles of hydroxide divided by my liters of solution, which I've got right here, five, five, seven liters. And this gives me a concentration of, let's see, there's a calculation, two, zero, one molar hydroxide. Okay, we're getting close, I promise. We're getting very close here. Okay, so now that I know my concentration of hydroxide, again, remembering I'm trying to get to pH, there are a couple different ways that, that you can do this. You can take your concentration of hydroxide and convert it into a concentration of hydronium using this equation right here. But what I like to do, what I find easier, is to actually take this concentration of hydroxide and calculate pOH first and then convert it into pH. So my pOH is simply the negative log of my concentration of hydroxide, 0.201 molar. And when you put that in your calculator, you get a pOH of 0.6. Nine, seven. Okay, that's great. But remember, this is pOH. We're looking for pH. So if I continue my calculation up here, remember that pH is 14 minus pOH. I just find this way of calculating a little easier. But again, you can do it however it makes the most sense to you. You can always go to the concentration of hydronium and get your pH that way, and you will get the same pH, 0.303. All right, so now for the logic check. We got a pH of 13, that's above seven. That means we have a basic solution. Does that make sense? Should we have a basic solution? And yes, we should have a basic solution because we have a solution with excess barium hydroxide in it. It's making hydroxide anion, so we should have a pH that's above seven. Um, the one uh, kind of difficulty with going the way that I just calculated it is a lot of students um, don't think about the fact that they've actually just calculated pOH and they'll just write it down as pH. But think logically again, if you had a pH of 0.697, that would be a very acidic solution. That would be um, a very strong acid, but you've just worked through a calculation where you've used a strong base. So that doesn't quite work, right? You should have a pH that's above seven. So hopefully, Keeping that logic in mind and seeing kind of those red flags will help make sure that you are following the next step and saying, oh, wait, this makes sense. I've actually calculated pOH, not pH. And then it's a very simple conversion to calculate pH from pOH. Okay, let's make sure there are no questions and I don't see any questions. So we will keep going. Now, <laughs> We're still not done with this problem, right? So that was 15 milliliters before the equivalence point, but we also need to calculate what happens after the equivalence point. So let's go back. So that was 15 milliliters before, and now we want to know the pH of the reaction five milliliters after the equivalence point. So this is really not that much after the equivalence point. So what, what is happening at this juncture? All right, so I am going to need to add again another blank page. And let me know in um, either the, the comments here or later in YouTube or Facebook. I know that many of you are watching this on mobile, so I wanna make sure that I'm writing large enough uh, that you can see what the calculations that I am doing on mobile, but it does mean that I switch screens a lot. So just let me know um, uh, how that works for you and I wanna make sure that you can see everything that I am doing. All right, let's go on to calculating the pH five milliliters after 
the equivalence point. All right. Oops, let's switch back to blue. <laughs> All right, so again, remembering the volume of my equivalence point. And again, I'm going to switch back because I have done this calculation. I just need to find it. Here's my equivalence point at 50.7 milliliters of nitric acid added. So I am going to be adding five milliliters more of nitric acid. I'm going past the equivalence point. So you can think of this as you are adding five milliliters extra of nitric acid. So my volume is going to be 50.7 milliliters plus five milliliters. Of course, that gives me 55.7 milliliters of nitric acid added total. All right, so we know our volume of nitric acid, but what I really want to know, because I'm going to have to do stoichiometry, right, is how many moles of nitric acid have I added at this point? All right, remembering our formula for concentration. Remember I said we would use this a lot? We have used this a lot. <laughs> All right, I don't know yet how many moles of nitric acid this is, but I know my concentration and I know my volume. And so I have added 0 0.418 moles of nitric acid. All right, again, um, because we are past the equivalence point, we should have added more moles of nitric acid than we actually needed. So if you go back and look at our first page of calculations, you can see we only needed 0 0.038 moles, but we have added 0 0.04 moles. So we are on the right track. These calculations are making sense with what is physically going on. We have added more moles than we needed. Again, this is really another limiting reagent problem because we have our moles of barium hydroxide and we have our moles of nitric acid. We have moles of both our reactants. But the nice thing is, in this case, we know that our limiting reactant is our barium hydroxide because this is after the equivalence point. So we have excess acid, which means that our limiting reactant is our barium hydroxide. This is great because we already know our moles of barium hydroxide. So we have 0 0.0190. Again, this is our moles of barium hydroxide that we started with. So, sorry, moles of barium hydroxide. Great. And what we need to know is how many moles of nitric acid have we used? So we're going to have some left over. We know how much we started with. Now we need to know how much we have used. Okay, so using my, again, my balanced chemical equation, which is a 1 to 2 ratio, 2 moles of nitric acid. And that means that we have used 0 0.0380 moles of nitric acid, which actually we've already done this calculation, but it's kind of nice to see again. All right, so this is how many moles of nitric acid we have used. We know how many we have added. We want to know how many are left over, right? So some of them have reacted and some of them have not reacted. So at the start, we have our 0 0.04, one, oops, 418 moles of nitric acid. This is how much we started with. How much? have we used? We just did that calculation. 0, 0.380. 0. This is how many we've used. So how many are left over in our flask? Well, we're just going to subtract these two and we have just a little bit. 0, 0.38 moles of nitric acid. All right, so this is how many moles of nitric acid we have left in our flask. We've reacted all of our barium hydroxide. That is all gone. And now we have just 0 0.0038 moles of nitric acid. 
All right, so remember how when we talked about barium hydroxide, we had to remember that we got two hydroxide anions from each barium hydroxide. The nice thing about this problem is our nitric acid in aqueous solution is all a one-to-one -one ratio. So that means for every one mole of nitric acid I have, I have one mole of hydronium. So my moles of nitric acid also equal my moles of hydronium, which means no extra math. That's fabulous, right? But uh, I do need to calculate my total volume of solution at this point because I need a concentration of hydronium. So I have my moles of hydronium, but I don't yet have my volume to calculate my concentration. So my, for my total volume, remember I started with that 20 milliliter sample of barium hydroxide. So I started with 20 milliliters. I have now added 55.7 milliliters to that. So my total volume, whoops, is 75.7. Ah, I'm gonna kinda, kinda squeeze that in. So I have 75.7 milliliters as my total volume of solution, which means I can calculate my concentration. So my concentration is my moles of hydronium, which again is 0 0.0038 moles of hydronium, divided by my total volume, which I just calculated. Of course, I'll have to convert that into liters, but that is not a problem. Oh, apparently that is a problem because I forgot my seven. <laughs> Seven, five, seven liters. So for my concentration of hydronium, I get 0 0.0502 hydronium. Now again, because we're dealing with an acid, calculating pH means we don't have to run through pOH. We can just straight up calculate a pH. So our pH is simply the negative log of our concentration of hydronium. 0 0.0502. So our pH for this solution is 1.299. Again, does that make sense logically? We have a pH that is less than 7. We have an acidic pH. Yes, that makes sense. And we have a strongly acidic pH because we've got a strong acid in solution. But you can see how much the pH has changed, even just five milliliters past the equivalence point. So remember at the equivalence point, our pH was seven. It's already dropped down to 1.3, basically, just adding five milliliters over. This is why when you're doing titrations, it's so important not to overshoot the end point if you're looking for a, uh, a color change, because the pH is going to drop very dramatically, in, in this case, by adding a strong acid in excess. All right, let's make sure there are no questions. This was quite a long problem, but we have a, another problem to at least start. I know we're talking about 745 here, so I'm not sure if we're going to get through our second problem, but I want to at least start our second problem. Um, all right, so oh, let's just read through it. Uh, a 35 milliliter aliquot of 0.35 molar, uh, that is hydrocyanic acid actually, uh, is titrated with a 0.15 molar solution of lithium hydroxide. How many milliliters of lithium hydroxide need to be added to reach the equivalence point? What is the pH at the equivalence point? And what is the pH of the reaction 50 milliliters before the equivalence point? And then what is the pH of the reaction two milliliters at the equivalence, after, sorry, after the equivalence point? So you can see how this is the same type of question. So we've got an acid and a base and we're reacting them together. We wanna know, um, how many milliliters of, in this case, lithium hydroxide we need to add to this weak acid to fully titrate it or to reach the equivalence point. Um, so titrating just means you're adding a small amount until you reach that stoichiometric equivalence point. 
Um, and then, of course, we want to know the pH at the equivalence point, and then we're going to look at what has happened before the equivalence point and what has happened after the equivalence point. And and seeing that we're at 7:45, I'm just I know I'm not going to make it through this, but hopefully we'll make it through the first part of this problem. And then again, let me know if you want to see the rest of the problem worked out in the next live stream, or if you would actually like to see a different topic. Now this one is a little bit different because we're dealing with a weak acid and a strong base. So we're going to have to take equilibrium into account. But before we do that, just like we did on the previous problem, we need a chemical equation and we need to balance that chemical equation. All right, so we have hydrocyanic acid plus lithium hydroxide. Again, it doesn't matter that we're reacting a weak acid with a strong base. Whenever you have an acid reacted with a base, again, assuming we're not dealing with Lewis acids and bases because that's a whole nother ball game, we're going to get salt and a water. So our salt is going to be lithium cyanide. And of course, we're going to get water as well. So then the question is, just like last time, we just need to make sure that it's balanced and this, this is balanced as is. So the one thing that'll be easier in this problem is we're dealing with a one-to-one -one ratio. So our stoichiometry becomes much easier and actually our equilibrium problems are gonna become easier too. Okay, so we need to, <laughs> we're gonna have to do stoichiometry first, which means we need to figure out moles. So again, looking at what I'm given, I'm given a volume and a concentration of my weak acid, and I'm only given a concentration of my strong base. So just based on what I'm given, I wanna calculate my moles of my weak acid. But again, thinking about physically what's going on here, what I've got is I've got this aliquot or this sample. So an aliquot is a sample of, in this case, hydrocyanic acid. So you've got this sample of acid and you are usually drop wise adding, um, in this case, lithium hydroxide until you reach that equivalence point. So we wanna know how many milliliters you've added at the equivalence point without actually having to go into the lab and do it. And we can do this all mathematically. So I am going to first calculate my moles of hydrocyanic acid. And again, I'm gonna do that with you know, we're using the formula for concentration. Again, I'll go ahead and put it up for this problem as well, just so we have it once <laughs> in each problem. So that's moles of solute over liters of solution. So in this case, I know my concentration is 0 0.350, and that is for hydrocyanic acid. I don't yet know how many moles that is. So that is my X. And for my liters of solution, I have a 35 milliliter sample. So again, just doing a quick conversion to liters. So my moles, my X is 0 0.0123 moles of hydrocyanic acid. Okay, well, that's kind of easy to remember, isn't it? So now that I know how many moles of hydrocyanic acid I started with, again, this is nice that it's a one-to-one -one ratio because I'm just, I'll go ahead and write it out. So my moles of hydrocyanic acid, how many moles of lithium hydroxide do I need for that? Well, it's just one-to-one, -one, which makes my math so easy. So you can see I am calculating how many moles of lithium hydroxide I need, but it's the same number of moles. One, two, three moles of lithium hydroxide. This is how many moles of lithium hydroxide I need. So then the question is, all right, if I need to add that many moles of lithium hydroxide, how many milliliters of that solution do I need to add? And of course, I'm gonna go back to my concentration I know the concentration of lithium hydroxide. That is 0.15 molar. I know how many moles I need. One, two, three moles of lithium hydroxide. And now I'm trying to figure out how many liters of solution that is. So when I do that calculation, 
Where is, oh, there it is. I was like, I know I've done that calculation. 0 0.82 liters, which is 82.0 milliliters of lithium hydroxide. Okay, so that means for, to get to the equivalence point, I'm going to need to add 82 milliliters of lithium hydroxide to my 35 milliliter aliquot of hydrocyanic acid. Now, the next part of this do, okay, so we can at least fully answer the first part of this question. So we know how many milliliters of lithium hydroxide we added. Um, and let's go ahead and calculate the pH at the equivalence point, because then at least we'll do a little bit of equilibrium at this point. So I think I'm just going to go ahead and go to another screen, because there's no way I'm getting that through this screen. Hold on, let me go back and talk about this for just a second. So uh, in our previous problem, we had a strong acid and a strong base. And of course, at the equivalence point, we have no more of our reactants because they have both reacted in stoichiometric equivalence amounts. So all we have are our products. So in this case, we have our salt, lithium cyanide, and we have water. Now, when we had our strong acid and our strong base, our salt did not have any acid-base property, properties, so our pH was dominated by pure water. Of course, our pH was seven. Well, in this case, um, our lithium cyanide actually does have acid-base properties, so our salt is going to dominate our pH. This is where the equilibrium comes into play. So our lithium cyanide, of course, in aqueous solution gives us lithium cations, and cyanide anions. Now, the lithium cation is not going to do anything. It has no acid-base properties, but our cyanide anion does have acid-base properties, and I know it has acid-base properties because it is the conjugate base of a weak acid. Therefore, it is going to have acid-base properties. So what happens is we've got this cyanide anion again in aqueous solution. So this is the chemical reaction that is happening in the aqueous solution. Now it is in equilibrium. Again, this is the conjugate base of a weak acid. So it is a weak base. It's in equilibrium, but it is going to form just a little bit of our hydrocyanic acid and some hydroxide. Again, this is a conjugate base, so we would expect it to give us hydroxide in aqueous solution. Now, again, it's in equilibrium, it's just a little bit, but it is still enough to alter our pH from seven. So what we need to do is we need to do an equilibrium problem on this equation right here, which means we need our concentration of cyanide. We don't have our concentration of cyanide, but we should be able to get our moles of cyanide. So we started with, again, our 0 0.0123 moles of hydrocyanic acid. Okay, so I'm just going to do some stoichiometry here. So in this case, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to start with my moles of hydrocyanic acid, and I'm going to figure out how many moles of lithium cyanide I formed once I know how many moles of lithium cyanide I formed, I'm going to figure out how many moles of cyanide anion I have. Now, the great thing is these are all one-to-one -one ratios, so the math is very easy, but I want to show you how um, all of the units work. So my one, again, this one-to-one -one ratio is from my first balanced chemical equation of my acid reacting with my base. And then once I know my moles of lithium cyanide, I go to this equation, which again is a one to one ratio. So one mole of lithium cyanide will give me one mole of my cyanide anion. So when I, I mean, again, the math here is very easy. All we're doing is multiplying and dividing by one. So that means I have 0 0.0123 moles of cyanide anion. So again, the math is easy, but I don't wanna just throw out, oh, I've got the same number of moles of cyanide. I want to, I want you to make sure you know why we have the same number of moles, because as we saw in the previous problem, our um, stoichiometric ratios are not always one-to-one, -one, so we want to make sure we keep that in mind. Okay, so we have our moles. We need our volume of solution. Okay, so total volume of solution. <sighs> 
because we need our concentration to do our equilibrium problem. So we started with a 35 milliliter sample of a hydrocyanic acid. I'll just go back and show. I'm getting that 35 right here from the problem itself. Plus our 82 milliliters. Whoops, that's milliliters to give us 117 milliliters. I'm sorry, I should explain this. 82 milliliters, remember we're at our equivalence point. That is our 82 milliliters of lithium hydroxide that we added. So that is where that 82 comes from. So we have a total volume of 117 milliliters. So we have our moles, we have our volume, we can get our concentration of cyanide. Okay, so our total concentration, again, is our moles, one, two, three, moles of cyanide over our total volume, don't forget to convert it into liters. And so we get a concentration of 0.105 molar. Okay, that's great. All this to say, now that we have our concentration, we can go back and work our equilibrium problem because what we're gonna do is we're gonna set up an ice table. I know, get excited, right? Okay, so ice, I, initial, how much do we have initially? We just calculated this. We have 0 0.105 molar, and we don't have any product yet initially. C, consumed. We're going to consume a little bit of cyanide, and we're going to form some acid and base. And, of course, E, equilibrium, we're just going to add down our columns. So this is 0 0.105 minus X. This is X and this is X. All right, so now we know our concentrations. What we've got is we've got to write our K. Now, remember, cyanide is a base, so this is a KB, and it's just products over reactants. So this is HCN times hydroxide over our cyanide anion. So we can plug in all of our concentrations and we can figure out what X is. But we have some problems here. Okay, so let's first deal with the right-hand side of our equation. So both of these are X, that's X squared. Our denominator is 0 0.105 minus X. And of course this equals KB. Remember this is a base. Um, but we don't have a KB for cyanide, so we're going to need to figure that out. So let me just run back to our problem here. While we don't have a KB for cyanide, we do have a KA for hydrocyanic acid. That means we can calculate the KB for its conjugate base. So let me change colors. So we're gonna have KA times KB equals KW. Again, that is the equilibrium constant for water. This is for conjugate pairs. So this only works for acid-base pairs that are conjugate acid-base pairs. So you cannot calculate KA for hydrofluoric acid if you know uh, KB for a different base. It only works for conjugate pairs. So I can get the KB for cyanide from the KA for hydrocyanic acid. So again, I know my KA, that was 4.0 times 10 to the negative 10th. I'm going to solve for KB, and of course KW is 1 times 10 to the negative 14th. That is a constant that honestly I would recommend that you just straight up memorize because you'll use it in a lot of different places. So my KB for, again, for cyanide, when I do this calculation, I get a KB of 2.5 times 10 to the negative fifth. So now I can plug in for my KB and I can solve this equilibrium problem pro like you're used to solving equilibrium problems. Okay, so let me get that number in. So this is 2.5 times 10 to the negative fifth. All right, now the nice thing about this is we can simplify this denominator by dropping our minus x. Now, just because of time right here, I am not going to go through um, all of the checks. So I won't check 
um, on screen the 500 rule or the 5% rule, but just know that it does follow those and you can check those on your own if you so desire. So what this means is this equation simplifies tremendously, which makes it a lot easier to calculate X because then I'm just taking a square root. So I get a value for X of 0 0.0016. Again, at this point, we want to remember what X means physically. So if I go back to my ice table, I see that X is my concentration of hydrocyanic acid, but more importantly, X is my concentration of hydroxide. So if I have my concentration of hydroxide, I can get to pH. So again, this is concentration of hydroxide. So just like I've done before, I'm actually going to first calculate pOH and then use that to calculate pH. So pOH is simply my negative log of my concentration of hydroxide, 0, 0, 1, 6. So that is a 6. So my pOH is 2.79, which means my pH is simply 14 minus that number, 2.79. And that gives me a pH of 11.21. Again, that makes sense. We have a conjugate base in solution. We should have a pH that is above 7. But you can see the difference here between um, the pH equivalence point of a strong acid and a strong base is going to be 7. But the pH of um, a, either a strong acid in a weak base or a strong base in a weak acid, your pH is going to either be higher or lower depending on what you're dealing with because you've got to go through that equilibrium calculation. And it just depends on the nature of either that, in this case, the conjugate base of that weak acid, but you could also be dealing, dealing with a conjugate acid of a weak base as well. So because we are after eight o'clock, um, I will let you go. But again, please let me know in the comments or again, you can send me a message if you wanna see the rest of these problems worked out or if you'd like to see something different in the next live stream. Um, I really wanna make sure that I am presenting problems that you find helpful, um, topics that you're covering in class or topics that you might be struggling with. Well, thank you so much for joining me and I hope you have uh, an enjoyable rest of your day and I hope to see you in the next live stream. Thanks. Bye.